Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the December 15th, 2023 California Board of Behavioral Sciences Telehealth Committee meeting. My name is Chris Jones. I'm chairperson of the committee. Before we convene, I would like to remind everyone present that the board is a consumer protection agency charged with administering and enforcing the board's laws. Where protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests sought to be promoted, the protection of the public shall be paramount. The Board of Behavioral Sciences will hold a public meeting via WebEx platform pursuant to the statutory provisions of Government Code Section 11133, telecom teleconference locations are not provided. I will announce when we are accepting public comment on the various issues. For each public comment period, we will first be accepting comments from the participants in the audience present in the room. Although we are completely remote, so uh, we will only be accepting um, <laughs> comments from our remote participants. Uh, when the moderator will open the lines, it's appropriate so that the remote uh, audience members can comment. Each commenter will have uh, two minutes to comment. Moderator, would you please provide the audience instructions on how they may participate during the meeting at the appropriate times? Moderator? Is it working this time? I hear, we hear you now. Go ahead. Perfect. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. We uh, are, um, when we go for public comment, we will display a visual like this. We would ask everyone to raise their virtual hand. You can do that by tapping the hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial-in users will need to dial star three in order to raise a hand. If... Um, you are using a mobile device, be aware that you have three different screens and only one of them has that hand button available to you. So pay attention to which one that is. If you are having trouble and uh, you have a mobile device or a computer, we have a Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen where you can type the word comment and we will get to you that way. Public comment will be given, bear with me just a second here. Um, two minutes to speak with a 15 second warning. And that's how you make a public comment. All right, thank you, moderator. Members during the roll call, please introduce yourself and let the public know whether you are a public or a licensed member. Christina, please call roll to establish a quorum. Good morning. Chris Jones? Here. Uh, LEP member and chair. Kelly Ranasinghe. Morning here, Kelly Ranasinghe, public member. Susan Friedman. Susan Friedman here, public member. We have a quorum. Thank you, Christina. Um, next, oh, thank you. Before we begin, I want to remind all speakers to remain on topic when making comments on the agenda items. Um, next on our agenda is introductions. This is the time that staff and public participants can introduce themselves. Introductions are voluntary for members of the public. Staff, please introduce yourselves. Hi, uh, good morning. Steve Stodergren. I'm the Executive Officer of the Board of Behavioral Sciences. And good morning to everyone. I am Marlon McManus, the Assistant Executive Officer for the Board. And good morning. I'm Rosanna Helms. I'm the Legislative Manager for the Board. I'm Christina Kitamura. I'm the Administrative Analyst for the Board. Good morning, Sabina Knight, Legal Counsel for the Board. Is that everybody? I believe so. That's it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, are there any members in the audience that would like to introduce themselves? Moderator? Uh, we have a hand raised from Colin User 2. Bear with us just a moment. We're going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. Uh, as a reminder to everyone, please tap that hand button at the bottom of your screen. Dial in users, dial star three to raise a hand. And mobile device users, you have three different screens and only one of those has a hand. Caller two, I have sent you a request to unmute your microphone. You will probably need to dial star six in order to do so. Hi, I, I think I'm early in introductions. I just wanted to introduce myself, Kathy Atkins from CAMP. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. 
And that was our only request at the moment. Do All right. Thank you, moderator. Uh, next on the agenda is the consent calendar discussion and possible approval of the June 8th, 2023 committee meeting minutes. Um, do the board members have any suggested suggested amendments or should the minutes be approved? I, I think the minutes should be approved. Second. All right. I, we, I guess we have a motion. We have a motion and the motion to Sorry. go ahead go ahead susan this is sabina oh motion to approve the minutes from june 8th 2023 you are reading my mind excellent what was in your mind <laughs> <laughs> to, to include the date of the meeting for the okay. approval of the minutes thank you i believe we had a second from kelly is that correct yes Perfect. All right. Um, are there any uh, comments from the public? We are accepting public comments on the motion. If you would like to make a comment on the meeting minutes, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of your screen. Dial in users, dial star three to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue with the motion? Uh, yes, thank you, moderator. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry, are there any additional uh, board member discussions regarding the, the minutes? Oh, all right. Then, Christina, would you please take the roll call? Chris Jones? Yes. Kelly Ronatinga? Yes. Susan Friedman? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Christina. Next on our agenda is the overview of committee of the committee's roles and tasks. Uh, Roseanne, would you please provide us with an overview? Yes, thanks, Chris. So um, the telehealth committee has been going for almost three years now. Um, it held its first meeting in January of 2021. Um, the purpose of the committee was to determine if any of the board's statutes and regulations related to the practice of telehealth needed to be updated or modified. Um, and so we've, we've accomplished a lot with this committee. Um, we've, um, we're gonna be taking a look at today our existing um, regulations related to telehealth. Um, in, in the past uh, um, months, our effort and years, our efforts have been, um, we now have added a baseline telehealth coursework requirement via AB 1759 and also via that same bill. We've made a lot of clarifications for the um, law related to telehealth for associates and trainees. Uh, we signed, got um, AB 1758 signed into law that allowed supervision via video conferencing in all settings. Um, our temporary practice bill allowance, um, AB 232, was just signed by the governor in October and will be going into effect January 1st. We've developed some telehealth best practices documents that are on the website. Uh, we've had a discussion of interstate compacts, um, and we're kind of wrapping up with um, discussion today of online-only telehealth teletherapy platforms and other alternative alternative modes of therapy. So the topic of telehealth is, of course, a very extensive one. Um, it's going to be relevant for this profession indefinitely. Um, but we've kind of wrapped up the major goals of this committee. So this is going to be, um, we've chosen to end the committee at this time. So this will be our last meeting of this committee for now. Um, future issues related to telehealth and any, any proposals um, recommendations of the committee that come out of today's meeting will go on to be discussed as a policy and advocacy committee um, and then can move forward from there and the committee can be reinstated by the chair at any time if a, if a need is identified for a special committee um, so we really examined a lot with this committee and it's, it's accomplished a lot and so um, we're going to to move on to of course continuing to to discuss issues related to telehealth at the PNA committee level and the board level, um, but we're going to move on to focus on other special select committees like our workforce development committee at this time. That's all, Chris. Do you have anything you want to add? No, just I want to thank you and the and you know our committee members and the rest of the 
of the staff for all the hard work that everyone has put in. Um, this is a short lived committee, but I believe that we got a lot done um, and are you know, really working to support um, you know, the uh, uh, telehealth within California to make sure that we are doing it the right way and um, protecting consumers. So I really do truly appreciate everybody's hard work. Um, and I think that um, we should all give ourselves a pat on the back for, for everything that, that we've done in the last three years. So thank you. All right, next on our agenda is um, item number six, <coughs> excuse me, discussion and possible recommendation regarding the board's current telehealth laws, which is California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Section um, 1815.5 and Business and Professions Code, Section 2290.5. Uh, Roseanne, would you provide us with an overview? Um, yeah, I think we actually skipped one of the online only Therapy platforms. Do you want to? Oh, we sure did. I apologize. Let's move, let's. let's uh, I, I got a little ahead of myself. Let's back up to uh, to item number five. Um, discussion regarding the online only platform to, uh, therapy platform. Roseanne, can you give us an uh, overview of that, please? Yeah. So this is a follow up of a discussion that we had at our last telehealth committee meeting. Um, and so the the discussion centered around the increasing use of online only teletherapy platforms and also alternative modes of therapy such as texting. And those those kind of new new um, creations raise the question of whether these methods pose any new public protection concerns that the board needs to monitor or address. So at past meetings, the telehealth committee had prepared and administered a survey for licensees and registrants who had had experience working for online only therapy platforms and other using other modes of therapy. Um, and we were trying to gain some more information about those therapists' experience in working for those other platforms and identifying any potential areas of concern that might be arising that are new. Um, the survey was open last spring. We used social media and our email subscriber lists and also sought the help of professional organizations to get the word out to distribute the survey. And we were pretty successful. We got over 1,700 responses to the survey. Um, and I've included in attachment B of your packet, the, the results for the multiple choice questions, the open-ended questions we looked at last time. Um, so we can refer back to that committee if, if anybody would like to see the results of the open-ended questions, <laughs> excuse me. But um, the survey results were discussed in detail at our telehealth committee meeting, last meeting last June. Uh, and that from that, the committee identified three potential areas of concern based on the survey re results. Um, and the first one was that there was a concern related to reporting from some therapists that their online only therapy platform had matched them to clients in states where they were not licensed. So that was one area of concern. There was a concern related to how the custodian of record and informed consent agreements were managed. Some, some um, therapists were, were not aware of how the, the online only platform did that. And then there was a concern that some therapists seemed unclear about whether there were any requirements to have an emergency plan by the platform. Um, so those were three sort of key areas that were identified. Um, so I've, I've included in your packet the survey results um, related to each of those three key areas. And so the committees, after discussing this at the last meeting, the committee direction to staff was to do two different things. Um, it was to meet with the staff members from the Senate Assembly and Business Professions Committee at the legislature. Those are the two committees that have um, direct oversight of the board. And then the other direction was to draft a letter for some providing some guidance for online only therapy platforms. Um, so first, um, I'll touch on our meeting with the, the Senate and Assembly Business and Professions Committee. We met with those um, two committee staffers to discuss the survey results. Um, we showed that we provided them with the survey results um, and the identified area concern of concerns and um, discuss with them how they feel that it relates to the board's consumer protection mandate regarding individual practitioners versus online only therapy platforms. Um, and so the committee staff were really appreciated and interested to see the survey results. Um, they indicated that they're they're aware that there's a lot of emerging issues with telehealth and that they're they're moving forward with kind of examining and keeping an eye on those issues as well. And they both indicated that they would report our survey information to their respective chairs and reach back out if they had any further questions. Um, they have let me know that they're planning a um, they're 
they're trying to get together a, a hearing that's going to encompass kind of workforce development in general um, that would have um, that we would be invited to attend and they're hoping to set that up sometime in January, it sounds like. Um, so that might touch further on the issue or provide, um, they might have more questions for the board at that time. They also noted that there's a couple of other boards that are really grappling with the issue of telehealth um, in the practice of their profession, and that is the Board of Optometry and the Board of Vet Med. Um, so I reached out to the executive officers of both of those boards. Optometry, um, they're in the kind of the same position as, as us, kind of, but we kind of we were at the beginning of this that their law is mainly silent on telehealth, but there's some a couple of particular sticking points in their law that that are they're working on, um, and then vet med um, kind of the same thing. They're just they just had a bill that's going to allow um, telehealth without the, an, an initial in person meeting for the vets um, for that. Um, both of those both of those uh, boards do have. Um, have the, so, some sort of a facility license, but they but they operate a little bit different than than our practitioners for optometry. Um, they have fictitious name permits for business, and they have um, dispensing opticians that are so they kind of they kind of regulate a profession that's a little bit different than ours in that they have an optometrist and then they have people that dispense glasses, and then the vet med board they have registration permits for their vet facilities. Um, and they do have a clause in their law that I thought was kind of interesting that the premises um, should not interfere with or control the professional judgment of the licensee. So we found some kind of interesting information. I think the consensus with um, the Senate and Assembly BMP is kind of it's early um, and and we're kind of keeping an eye on things. So that's that was kind of my takeaway from from that. We're going to they're going to continue to discuss with their bosses and monitor. The second, um, the second task um, that the committee had wanted completed, we draft to draft a letter providing guidance to online only therapy platforms, um, and we kind of ended up drafting it and instead of two online only therapy platforms that there might be kind of an infinite number of because we don't regulate those directly. Um, it, it ended up being kind of a guidance document for somebody that's working with an online only therapy platform that basically is reminding them that, hey, you know, these are your responsibilities as a licensee. So if you're working for this platform, be mindful that you're responsible for things like the emergency plan, um, things like documenting where the client is so that you, you know in case of an emergency, um, following all the board's telehealth laws and regulations, making sure that you protect confidentiality. Things like that. So that document we thought might be um, good to place on our website under like a telehealth section, and that is shown in attachment A. Um, and so, I think with that, I will open it up for discussion and comment. All right. Thank you, Rosanna. I appreciate um, all your hard work. Uh, do we have any uh, comments from our committee members, Susan? Roseanne, thanks so much. That's really, really helpful. But I'm wondering if you have talked to like the psychology board or the medical board. I mean, telehealth is really out there and it seems like everybody's using it as opposed to going to the office of the person. So I'm wondering what they had to say. Um, we also, also, it seems to me that if all these places are going to begin to use telehealth, the legislature would eventually have some interest in their overseeing of what's going on. Yeah, the legislature, they're, they're kind of monitoring it. And I suspect um, when our board is up for sunset, um, which I believe, Steve, that'll be next year that we have our sunset hearing, that it'll, we'll, we'll probably yeah. have some questions to address um, from them. That's probably where we're going to hear about it and where they'll kind of um, Discuss, discuss with us what their particular concerns are. Um, and so in terms of that, that that's prop, that's my sense of, of when that will be addressed if they want to address anything. They're kind of in the information gathering stages right now. They heard from us, we, they got our survey. Um, in terms of psychology and medical board, we kind of have an ongoing 
relationship with psychology board. They they just about a year or so ago adopted telehealth regulations. So my understanding is that they're pretty much in the same spot as as we are in terms of they've formulated some regulations and uh, their their law works a little bit different than ours in terms of what it says about telehealth. But basically, the the issues are are very similar. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Susan. Roseanne, as always, you've done an outstanding, outstanding job. I really like the guidance document. The the questions on our on the survey that you designed were illuminating an area which was previously unknown to the board. So again, thank you for that. It looks like a little more than a quarter of our lic licensees are, are using telehealth and the majority appear to be using better help. But I think we've done We've done what we want, what we were, we wanted to do, which was we illuminated it to the legislature. We ensured our regulations were up to par, and we provided a sort of this family of information now that we can utilize, and or they can utilize if they wish. So again, outstanding job. Thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. I want to echo that also. Um, I, you know, the survey did definitely open. Um, boards eyes up to things that are happening in the telehealth world world and uh, you know I think it at the end of the day we realize that we need to make sure that um, you know that, that falls under our you know our um, our purview to to um, you know protect consumers so I appreciate that as well thank you um, are there any uh, comments from the audience moderator we are now open for public comment on agenda item five. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of your screen. Mobile users, you have three different screens and only one of them has that hand button. So make sure you know which one uh, you're looking for. Uh, Dialing users, please dial star three to raise a hand and we will call on people in the order we have requests. You may also type the word comment in the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen if you're having trouble with anything and I will try and help you out. We're gonna take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Caller two, hold on just a moment. We're gonna send you a request to unmute your microphone. You may need to dial star six in order to unmute. Hi, this is Kathy Atkins from Camp. I just wanted to appreciate um, Um, I can't tell if I'm on because the moderator. You, you 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 disappeared for just a moment. You, you okay, want, got you, it. We heard um, appreciate. Got it. Um, so this is Kathy Atkins from Camp, and just wanted to appreciate the survey. I know, um, you know the the amount of people who answered is limited, but it's for the associations. It's helpful to see um, where there's some confusion and where there might be. Um, some areas that associations need to learn more about um, or areas that we're concerned about um, of what the online programs are doing for the providers versus the providers themselves. So I just wanted to say thank you for the data. Thank you, Kathy. And that appears to be our only request for comment at the moment. Do you wish to continue with the agenda? Uh, yes, thank you, moderator. Susan, I see your hand up. Do you have another comment or? I wanted to ask uh, Steve if we've gotten any complaints from any consumers. Um, well, we have received complaints from consumers, um, not necessarily re in regards to online therapy platforms themselves, but so. And I think what we're really, what we're seeing is the complaints are dealing with um, I, I, and this is anecdotal, so don't quote me on this, but kind of um, confidentiality and making sure that kind of the, um, making sure confidentiality and um, just the how, how people operate on on a virtual platform. And so that's why one of the things that came out of this uh, this um, committee, what were those best practice, not best practices, but suggestions for if you are going to operate, you know, in a virtual platform, then these things are you should take in consideration. And I think we'll still, we'll, we have those three documents and 
as we go along over the over the next months and years, you know, we'll try to see how we can reiterate that or put that information out there to help. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, with that, we'll move on to our next agenda item. Uh, back to item number six, discussion and possible recommendations regarding the board's current telehealth laws, the California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Section 1815.5, and Business and Professions Code, Section 2290.5. Uh, Roseanne, would you provide us with an overview? Yeah, so this is kind of our circle back. Uh, when, we, when we started the telehealth committee in 2021, one of the first things we did is we started out by taking a look at our telehealth regulations, which are section 1815.5 of the California Code of Regulations. And then we, we took a look at them, had a discussion, and then we, we said that when we were to end the telehealth committee, that we would wrap it up by looking at circling back and taking another look and seeing if, what, if any changes that the telehealth committee wanted to recommend. So just a little background before I dive into the meat of this. Um, the telehealth regulations for the board were first adopted in 2016. Prior to 2016, the board's law offered very little guidance about telehealth other than there was a definition uh, and some basic, basic requirements for patient consent and confidentiality in Business and Professions Code Section 2290.5. Uh, and that, so the lack of guidance at that time was causing confusion among licensees and registrants as telehealth was becoming more prevalent. And so that's why we pro had originally proposed in these telehealth regulations. Um, and so now the practice is these regulations have been in a place about eight years. Um, and so the practice is continuing to evolve and the board has received um, feedback that some of the regulations may need to be adjusted or reconsidered. So I've, um, I've divided this into about five different um, talking points. So what I think I'm going to do, and I have feedback from our regulation council who was not able to attend today, but she was um, gracious enough to, to provide us with some of her, her opinions as well on these items. So I'm going to discuss each one individually, um, weigh in with what our regulation council said, and then open each one up for discussion separately. I think that's the best way to do it. Um, so first, Potential amendment I want to talk about is switching um, section 1815.5 subdivision F and 1815.5 subdivision E. Um, and this was from a request from CAMP, um, and it was originally discussed at the initial telehealth committee meeting. Um, regulation um, subdivision E of 1815.5 states that a California licensee or registrant may only provide telehealth to a client in another jurisdiction if they meet the requirements to lawfully provide services in that jurisdiction and the telehealth is allowed by that jurisdiction. And the reason that we, we added this in um, when we did the telehealth regulations is because often the board licensees and registrants are not aware that it is common for jurisdictions to require their license to practice with a patient located there. And the board, our board does not have any say over that. If somebody's, if a client is located in New York, and if New York requires um, a New York license to treat a client um, located there, then that is required. Um, the board doesn't get to make any exceptions um, within New York's jurisdiction. So we wanted we wanted the therapists to be aware of that so that they were not inadvertently breaking the law um, in the other state and getting in trouble there. Um, so we we advised them in the in the regulations to check with the other jurisdiction where the client is located. Um, and then the, the next subsection of the regulations, subsection F, states that failure to comply with any of the telehealth provisions is unprofessional conduct. Um, and so CAMP has raised a concern at the time when we discussed this, and I've included their, their older letter, but I believe it, I've checked with them and it still stands, um, that making it unprofessional conduct if a therapist fails to check to make sure that they are following the laws of the jurisdiction where the client is located is too rigid and could lead to unintended consequences. Um, and so it they suggest that 1815.5e, the part about checking with the other state, be moved to after 1815.5f so that it functions as guidance rather than a requirement that one must follow to avoid discipline by the board. Um, so I've shown that amendment in attachment A. Um, the other board, the, a couple of other boards that I use as, as I included as references, the Board of Psychology, as I alluded to earlier, recently adopted telehealth regulations in 2021. 
Um, their regulations kind of address this as well in a slightly different way. It doesn't explicitly mention unprofessional conduct. Um, and then Arizona also has a reference to um, following the laws of other state and their telehealth regulations, and that should in reference to there's a link there. Um, so in terms of the proposal to flip flop it, um, when our regulatory council looked at that, they had some some comments and feedback regarding this. Um, the legal council does not feel that moving um, flip flopping basically subdivisions E and F would legally change anything. They don't feel that that's a substantive change. Um, and legal notes that it's already a unprofessional conduct to violate any of the board statutes and regulations. For example, section 4982E, and there's a provision for each license type, basically says violation of any of the board's laws or regulations is unprofessional conduct. So I probably, I would probably with that piece of information argue that even stating failure to provide, comply with these provisions is unprofessional conduct is probably unnecessary. Um, legal counsel against deleting the subsection advising licensees to check with the other jurisdiction altogether because it, it ensures that licensees understand that they might you know, if they don't check that they might be practicing illegal in another illegally in another jurisdiction and it can open them up to some potential consequences. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at with um, with with that. I um, I'm curious to see what the stakeholders and the board members would like to do with this. I, I think that the, the the sentence that says failure to comply with these provisions of unprofessional conduct is probably unnecessary. Um, in terms of the wording of, of providing telehealth to clients in other states, I think that's open for discussion. So I'll open up for that piece right now. Uh, thank you, Roseanne. I guess I have that question too, or like what, how would flip-flopping the, um, you know, those, those subsections make a difference legally um, would be my, was my first question that I had. And then, um, you know, again, uh, if it's overkill, to you know to state what is already stated you know i i don't have an issue with removing that um but it, it would seem that it would be the responsibility of the practitioner to determine whether or not they are practicing you know lawfully as they're as they're you know finding their clients i do understand the um you know the issue of uh, if you have a client that's traveling um but i believe that we have other provisions that allow for um you know for uh, leeway in that area don't we um we don't if the client's traveling i mean that it's, it's really up to the other state uh if the right. client's in the in another state i mean we don't provide any any guidance on there because it, it's in another state's jurisdiction right uh, okay. and that's the problem so that's why we warned them originally to check because uh, we don't have any control once the client leaves California's space. Right, right. So flip-flopping, it doesn't change the legality of, of okay. I just Not according to legal, legal, no. Okay, that, that was, okay, that was my big question. Um, Kelly or Susan? No, I didn't have a question. I'm, I'm hoping, I'd kind of like to hear what CAMF has to say because I'm having, I'm struggling with their letter a little bit like in the third paragraph, Camp says they are concerned about the connection between the two subsections as currently written and place could lead to unintended consequences. And if they could like maybe expand that out, because I'm I'm uncertain of any legal doctrine that you know that kind of affects the way some a subsection is placed, whether it's E or it's F. Is there a difference in the reading that I'm somehow missing? Okay. Well, with that, we will open it up for public comment, and I'm sure that we will invite Kathy Atkins to the table to, as she was one of the authors of the letter. So, moderator, would you please open up for public comment? We are open for public comment. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in user style star three to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. And as luck would have it, Kathy Atkins has a hand raised. Hold on just a moment. We're going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. Hi, 
Hi, this is Kathy Atkins from Camp. Um, thank you for your um, patience with us. The concern we had, um, and I'm sorry the letter wasn't clear, um, is just the way it's written right now is that um, it's talking about MFTs or, or licensees, registrants, um, following the laws of the other jurisdiction, which of course we support. Um, and the, but there are situations that occur, um, be, as Roseanne noted, this is kind of a newer grayer area that um, certainly, you know, if they're living there or something like that, but sometimes there are travel situations and there are um, emergency issues that, you know, we do have concerns about clinical um, client well, uh, welfare and safety. And by, I don't even know if it's a flip-flop of ENF as much as like a different section. And I appreciate the balance of, you know, the lawyers all having their say. Um, but when it says failure to comply with these provisions shall be considered unprofessional conduct, the way our legal is reading is not there, there is no gray area there. It is, you know, if you fail to do above, you have now committed unprofessional conduct. And if there's a situation where a clinician has a client traveling in another state and there's some kind of emergency issue, suicide, harm to others, harm to self, and, you know, well, hold on, let me stop. Let me try to figure out the Texas licensing board laws before I tell you not to go, you know, commit harm to yourself or others. Um, they're, they're, they're placed in a position of deciding to protect themselves because of this section or do, do good by, do, do um, you know, do no harm to the client. Obviously we're talking about um, this situation is in a day-to-day -day, uh, occurrence, but we are just concerned about the way it's written. Um, does that put that person in the position of absolutely, yes, you have now committed unprofessional conduct by statute, it says shall, um, without any review or assessment of those situations. Um, in emergencies. So, you know, I, I recognize it's difficult to sort of muddle through this on how best to write it, but we do want to address that situation because I do think they occur. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Roseanne, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, this is, I mean, and I recognize this is really nuanced um, because we're trying to get a point across, but, but yeah, recognize that every situation, you know, is different and every state is different. So what I would, would wonder at more, my thought would be because legal has told us that basically subdivision F right now, which we're proposing to make E, failure to comply with these provisions shall be considered unprofessional conduct. What my thought is, is what if we struck that, um, then, our laws are already in, in our unprofessional conduct sections. It's unprofessional conduct to violate or attempt to violate or conspire to violate any of the provisions of this chapter or any regulation adopted by the board. So that applies to all of our laws. So it kind of goes without saying that not following telehealth regulations is unprofessional conduct. Um, so if we struck the, that statement in there that's probably overkill and we left the the um, per part that said a licensee or registrant may provide telehealth services to clients in another jurisdiction if they meet the requirements to provide that in other states. Would that be sufficient or do we need to massage the language in F a little bit more? Um, that, that's kind of where I'm trying to thinking of going with it. Roseanne, this is Sabina. Can I uh, just add one thing? Yes, please. Um, so, um, just to maybe, um, um, make everybody feel a little better, even though the, the, the statement does say shall be considered unprofessional uh, conduct, as you recall, the board has discretion at any time, whether or not they pursue any type of, um, you know, um, discipline against anybody, you know, and they do an investigation, 
And, you know, obviously if, um, you know, facts come out to where there's an emergency situation and somebody felt they were working in the best interest of a person, what, what have you, but just, just because it says shall be considered unprofessional conduct doesn't mean it's going to result in something, right? So um, just always like keep that in the back of your head that just because it says it shall be considered unprofessional conduct doesn't mean that it's going to continue down that route, right? Sorry, Rosanna, I thought you were going to respond. Yes, I, uh, yeah, I agree. I, I, I agree I, I with you. Know. I, I still, I think we can strike the the shall be considered unprofessional conduct because if we had that, if if we were required to have it there, we would be required to basically have it in any provision that could possibly of our law that could possibly be considered unprofessional. Conduct. Correct. Okay. Correct. It, yes. Yeah. It's so it's overkill. We we already know that's unprofessional conduct to to you know. I. I I, agree. I mean, words of inclusion are words of exclusion. So, I mean, I would be okay striking that provision because it, it doesn't do anything. You know, it's it's just kind of a an overkill provision. And then that might resolve the other issue. So. We need to make a motion on that or we're going to move on to the next piece first. Um, I'd like to hear back from um, the from the stakeholders to see if that would would resolve their concern or if if there's still a concern that would remain. Okay. Moderator, would you open up the uh, the lines for public comment and flag down Kathy? We're gonna get Kathy back on the line. Hold on just a moment. Hi, Kathy Atkins from Camp. Thank you. Um, well, I can't say if it, it it makes the fear go away or the concern. Um, I do feel Camp has been heard by the BBS and the committee, and I appreciate that. And I do understand what Sabine and team are saying. And you know, certainly, it's up to the associations to kind of explain this law and sort of the um, black the gray areas that come with it to our members. Um, but I do, I, I thank Roseanne and team for um, uh, removing it, not because I don't think it should be on professional conduct, but because it's, you know, sort of like a neon pink sign at the bottom that, that makes it a little bit more confusing versus just an overarching follow the laws of the BBS or you're committing unprofessional conduct. So I appreciate the BBS committee considering this and Roseanne and Sabine working with us. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I would just say this too. Um, so this is not a final proposal today. It would still have to go back to we, what, what we're going to do is we're going to draft everything that we decide on today. It's going to come back to the policy and advocacy committee for further discussion. So if camp still has a concern with subdivision um, F um, or if they have a, a proposed modification or amendment that they'd like to see there, they will still have a chance to um, to, to let us know that and propose something too. So I'd say that it sounds like um, that we're moving forward with striking um, subdivision, what is currently subdivision F, which is failure to comply with these provisions shall be considered unprofessional conduct that gets struck. So with that, I will move on um, to item two. Um, okay, so the regulations currently, our telehealth regulations state that um, all persons engaging in, in our practices um, with a client who is physically located in California must have a valid and current license or registration issued by the board. Um, and so when I was reading this, I was, it was unclear to me what the definition, what is a valid and current California license or registration? Um, is valid mean current and active? Um, shouldn't we just say active? Like, what does that mean? So could it be an inactive license? So that was unclear. Um, and so our, I, our regulation council weighed in and according to her, valid is implied in the law to mean current, active and unrestricted. Um, and the comment on the text, um, if the license is restricted, this is, I'm quoting um, legal regular regulation council, if the license is restricted by the board, for example, to prohibit providing services to a particular population, then they should not be providing telehealth services to that population in another state. 
um, legal said that if the board has no concerns with restricted licenses, providing these services with, with a current and active license would meet the objective. So what I am, what I was thinking here, instead of saying a valid and current license, um, I don't think that the intent of the board is for somebody that that has a license is on some kind of probation to not be able to do telehealth. I think that it should say a current and active license, um, not a valid and current license. If you look at the meaning that the, that valid is current, active, and unrestricted for legal counsel. Um, and so I'm going to open up that for discussion right now. Uh, thank you, Roseanne. I, I'm okay with that. It sounds like it makes sense to me. Any comments from uh, other committee members? Kelly? No, I agree with Roseanne. And I agree too. Perfect. All right. Uh, do we have any comments from the public moderator? We are accepting public comment on agenda item seven. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in users, dial star three to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. As a reminder to our mobile device users, you have three different screens and only one of those has a hand. Figure out which one you need in order to raise your hand. If you're having trouble, type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Looking around, I see no request for public comment. Do you wish to continue with the agenda? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, so moving on to item number three. Um, so this has to do with something that the board has been discussing separately. Um, the board's policy and advocacy committee and actually the board at its November meeting has been discussing requirements to physically display a license and registration and whether those requirements in statute need to be updated to account for the use of telehealth. And so we're currently pursuing a legislative proposal. Staff got, got approval at, at the last board meeting to pursue a proposal to add to our required notice to consumers that's, um, that's given prior to initiation of therapy services or as soon as practically possible thereafter. But that particular notice, um, the proposal would require the licensee to include their name and license type and license number on it. So that the person at the beginning of therapy would be given all of that um, and then it's, it's done. So, um, but that bill proposal has not Obviously, it still has to go through the whole legislative process, so it's not law yet. Um, in the meantime, our telehealth regulations state in um, subsection C3 um, that the, the therapist is to provide the client with their license or registration number and the type of license or registration. Um, so just wanted to point that out, point out that um, that, that section, if this new law becomes effective that we're proposing, could become repetitive. Um, and I think that the remedy to that at this point is to, regulations have to go through a whole long process. We're, we're at the beginning of it. We still have to go through PNA. We have to get board approval. Um, and then it has to go through the DCA initial review process. I think that the remedy to this at that point is to kind of flag that section and watch it and possibly consider if that bill passes, um, putting a reference to this, to the section, I think MFT law, it's 4980.01. Um, so it would be maybe to ensure the client's registration number and the type of registration has been provided pursuant to section 4980.01. Um, but it's too soon to do that right now. Um, and so I would say that we probably need to watch this section and before this is finalized, um, see what the status of that bill is, but we definitely need to be aware of it. Okay, thank you, Roseanne. Any uh, any comments, committee members? Uh, I have no comments, Mr. Chair, but when appropriate, if we could take a five minute break. Uh, sure. Well, after we get public comment, we will do that. Susan, anything from you? No, thank you. Okay, all right. Uh, moderator, would you open up the, uh, the floor for comment? 
We are once again open for public comment. If you'd like to make a comment, raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Mobile users, you need to hit the dot, 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 or the ellipses button in order to find that hand button. Dial in users, dial star three to raise a hand. And we will call on people in the order we have requests. We're gonna take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue with the agenda? Uh, yes, thank you, moderator. All right, at the uh, request of our esteemed committee member, we will take a, uh, a five minute break. We will see everybody back at uh, 9.55. Um, excellent. We're all back. Uh, Roseanne, can you yeah. please continue? Thanks. Okay. So I'm on number, uh, number four, um, the, regarding the telehealth regulations, the documentation of emergency services. And I wanted to discuss that because that was one of the concerns that the committee had coming out of the, um, but when looking at the survey results was that, uh, it appeared that some, um, individuals using online therapy platforms were, unclear of what the the emergency plan should be or um, what the platform's emergency plan would be or if they even had one. So um, our telehealth regulations currently state that um, upon initiation of telehealth services, the licensee or registrant shall document reasonable efforts made to ascertain the contact information of relevant resources, including emergency services in the patient's geographic area. So my question to you today is whether that needs to be beefed up any more um, than that, or is, is there any suggestions? Um, when uh, Reg Council reviewed it, they had a um, a comment, and let me pull that out here. Um, so. They, they said that, that we could do something like specifying a written procedure and then specify exactly what that written procedure needs to be, such as the means of obtaining emergency care, um, a name, telephone number, and a location of a hospital or practice where the emergency care, practitioner where the emergency care is available in the city or county and giving a copy to the client, something like that. I don't know that um, we want to get I think that there's a balance that needs to be struck with that kind of thing in terms of the client could be traveling within the state um, from session to session and the, the therapist might, um, you know, have to change it. We don't want to have an overly burdensome requirement, but we want to make sure we want to kind of hit home that they need to have an emergency plan in place. Um, and so I, I'll open that up to discussion to see what the committee thinks of the current language and if any of that might need to change. I would agree, um, Roseanne, that that if we get too detailed in it, then um, you know we could run into problems because people do travel. Um, but I think that having a broad plan that um, requires the practitioner to um, you know make efforts to document the the resources and emergency services of where the the, the client is in the moment is would be would be important. So if they're traveling, you know, we need to understand that and be able to direct them in the right to the right place if if uh, you know if, if those uh, things are needed. Susan or Kelly? Well, the only thing I could think of, I mean, it doesn't really make sense to have them be changing things all the time. It's too complicated. But um, perhaps they, that they should let the client know that if they intend to be in a different location, could they please inform the therapist ahead of time? Because usually people do know ahead of time. I mean, it's, it's rare that it's suddenly that comes up at the last moment. And if it does, they'll, they'll deal with it. Kelly, thank you, Susan. I think the regulation as it stands is pretty specific. So 
I agree with board member board chair's comments that it's important to document emergency services. I don't know that we need to get more specific than that, um, particularly since you know, twenty eight percent of twenty eight percent of our um, active licensees are using telehealth, and a lot of the the consumers of telehealth tend to be rural. That that's a lot of resources that they would need to document. Right. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate that. Um, moderator, are there comments from the public? We are once again accepting public comment on this matter. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in users, dial star three to raise a hand. And we will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. As a reminder to our mobile device users, hit that ellipses button at the bottom of the screen, uh, the dot, dot, dot button, in order to uh, find the screen with your hand. Looking around, I see no request for public comment. Do you wish to continue with the agenda? Uh, yes, thank you, moderator. Okay, so Rosanne? what I'm hearing, oh, thanks, Chris. For what I'm hearing, we're not gonna be proposing any changes to the emergency services documentation. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. I'm going to move on then to the last item, um, industry best practices. Um, and so the current, um, this is a response to a stakeholder um, request at the last meeting that we consider this. Um, the current telehealth regulations require that every time a therapist provides services via telehealth, they must, quote, utilize industry best practices for telehealth to ensure both client confidentiality and the security of the communication medium. Um, and so stakeholders have noted, noted that the requirement to use industry best practices is a vague term, and it leads to confusion about exactly how this requirement is fulfilled. So we might want to discuss clarifying it. Um, one possible option that I found um, in uh, the Vet Med Board had a bill signed this year pertaining to telehealth for their board and in that, that, that states that a vet who practices via telehealth must, quote, ensure that the technology, method, and equipment used to provide veterinary services um, via telehealth comply with all current privacy protection laws. Um, so that's one example of a, of a way that it could be made better. Um, the Board of Psychology has something in their regs that says the licensee takes reasonable and steps to ensure that electronic data is transmitted securely and um, informs the client immediately of any known data breach or unauthorized, excuse me, dissemination of data. So that's how that board um, handled it. Um, our regulation council did weigh in on this particular item and that particular feedback was that um, regulation council understands the vagueness issue but notes that it gives the board flexibility to establish by expert testimony what those practices are. Um, they note that the, the problem with using the vet board example is that it's not clear what, what privacy protection laws we are referring to. And unlike statute, regulations have what's called a clarity standard that has to be met. So laws can be a little bit vague in term, if they're in statute, but OAL may require us to specify exactly what laws um, that might mean. And in thinking of that, if we did want to use the example, and I don't know if this would fly with regu the regulations attorneys, but um, we do have something in, in statute that says um, that, you know, in, in a certain context that somebody needs to comply with state and federal laws relating to confidentiality. Um, so we could try to specify it to that level, but I'll open it up for discussion, um, see what people think in terms of a solution to um, if we want to clarify that industry best practice wording. Thanks. I know that look, Kelly. I, I sort of like the veterinary medicine example, but you know, and I don't want to disagree with regulatory counsel because they, they know a lot more than me. But then if you attach the state and federal uh, rider on it, it would read something like ensure the technology method and equipment used to provide telehealth services comply with all state and federal privacy protection laws. Sounds pretty good to me, but um, it, that's just from where I'm sitting, Roseanne, you probably 
kind of studied this area a lot better. That's kind of what I'm thinking too. I don't, when we get down into the nuts and bolts of what OA, I'll accept there's a possible, I can work with Red Council and bring it back to the next meeting. I kind of, that's kind of what I was thinking too, but um, we might have, there is a chance we might have to get a little more specific. Um, and then when we go there, depending on how specific it gets, what whether we want to do that or not, it might change. When you get really specific, then you kind of risk leaving something out, but you don't want to be too vague either. So um, that's kind of what I'm thinking is maybe we can work with, with the um, Reg Council a little more to get the, to use the vet med option, but but make it meet OAL's requirements for specificity. And maybe to narrow it even further, you know, it doesn't need to be all state and federal privacy protection. It could be healthcare, you know, state yeah. and federal healthcare privacy protection laws. And then you're kind of narrowing it down to, to HIPAA and, and all the other healthcare provide privacy protection laws. So you're not doing like, you know, IT and stuff like that. I like that. Yeah. Okay. I do too. Thank you. I, I do too. I think that's really smart because it would be much too vague without putting that in, without adding specifically the word health or whatever. I agree. That's really good. Shoes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, moderator, are there comments from the public? We are once again open for public comment. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in user style star three to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take just a few seconds to see if we have a request for public comment. And hold on, we might have something written here. Uh, from Ben Caldwell says, thank you for taking up this issue of best practices language in the regulations. Any change here that removes that language will improve clarity and understanding. Apologies for not being on the mic. I'm on a plane with poor connection. <laughs> and that is our only comment, apparently. All right. Thank you, moderator. I hope Ben is traveling somewhere fun. Um, okay. With that, I think that wraps up the comment section, right, Roseanne? So what would be our next step? So the motion would be to, um, and I'll, I'll say what the motion is, and then I'll I'll go through the changes. So the motion would be to direct staff to make certain changes and bring to the policy and advocacy committee for further discussion and consideration. And the changes would be um, to propose in 1815.5 F and E to strike the, um, the statement saying that failure to comply with any provisions of the telehealth regulations is unprofessional conduct. Um, for item two, we would, instead of a valid valid and current license and registration, we would replace that with current and active. Um, for item three, we're just going to watch that um, to see how this goes with our future, with our bill proposal about display of license and registration. For four, emergency services, we're going to make no changes. And for five, we're going to um, draft 1815.5 D3 regarding industry best practices, more like the vet map, med, med model with referencing state and federal health health care laws. Um, and so it would be the motion would be to do those changes that were discussed, any non-substantive changes, and bring to the policy and advocacy committee for further discussion and consideration. Okay, I make a motion that we accept that. What Rose eliminated for us. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was muted. Sabina, does that is that does that meet the the threshold for what we need to do for a uh, a motion? Absolutely. Somebody can say just like Susan said. So move. Thanks, Roseanne. <laughs> Perfect. Then I will second. Any other comments from our from our board members? Uh, moderator, any comments from the public? We are open for public comment on the motion. If you'd like to make a comment please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in users, dial star three to raise a hand, and we will call on people in the order we have requests. As a reminder to our mobile device users, please hit that ellipses button, which is the dot, dot, dot at the bottom of your screen to find your hand.
Looking around, I see no request for public comment. Do you wish to continue with the motion? Yes, thank you, moderator. Okay, then uh, Christina, would you please call the vote? Yes. Chris Jones? Yes. Kelly Ronasinga? Yes. Susan Friedman? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Christina. Next on our agenda is item number seven, uh, suggestions for future agenda items. This is the chance to suggest topics that you would like to include in future board meeting discussions. Uh, do any committee members have additional future agenda items that they would like to propose? Well, I'd like to say that thank you very, very much for leading this commission while we've been in existence. And I think that we have done our work. The only thing that I can think of, and it's not for this committee, but it is for some committee, and I just want to throw it out there, is that when I did my Senate questioning thing, all they wanted to know about was artificial intelligence. So somehow or other on some committee, we need to address that subject. Okay, thank you, Susan. Um, yes, I know that AI is a very hot topic at the, at the moment. I, I have no comments, uh, Mr. Chair, but I also would like to echo Ms. Board Member Friedman's comments and thank you for leading the committee and thank all the staff for all their hard work. Appreciate that. Thank you both. Um, are there any, um, moderator, would you open up for public comment? Do we have any uh, future agenda items uh, from the public? We are open for public comment on future agenda items. This is item eight on your agenda. If you'd like to make a comment, this is your last chance. <laughs> Please raise a hand by tapping that hand button at the bottom of the screen. Dial in users, dial star three to raise a hand. And we will call on people in the order we have requests. Did I say that incorrectly? Do we have one more agenda? We do have one more agenda item, but that's- okay. My apologies. Not your last chance. <laughs> Nevertheless, I don't see any requests for public comment. Do you wish to continue? Yes, thank you, moderator. Um, and next on our agenda is public comment for items that are not on the agenda. As a reminder, the board may not discuss or take action on any matter raised during this public comment section, except to decide whether to place the matter on the agenda of a future meeting. Um, do we have any public comments from our committee members? Okay, um, thank you. And moderator, would you open up um, the lines to determine if we have public comments from the audience? All right, this is actually the last chance. Uh, please raise a hand if you'd like to make a comment for items uh, not on the agenda. Um, my train of thought is derailed. Uh, tap that hand button at the bottom of the screen to raise a hand. Dial in users, dial star three to raise a hand. And we will call on people in the order we have requests. We're gonna take just a few more seconds to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue with the agenda? Uh, yes, thank you, moderator. All right, and finally on our agenda, the next item is adjournment. I would like to uh, thank all of our staff and our committee members. It's been an honor and a pleasure to uh, chair this committee. I do feel that we have accomplished a lot in a short amount of time. Um, so with that, um, I would like to also wish everybody a very uh, happy holidays and um, happy new year. I hope that you all get to spend some quality time with family and friends, and we will see you at our next board meeting uh, or committee meeting. I think we get a committee meeting before the board meeting. Um, so with that, the meeting is adjourned. It is 10 15. Thank you all. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.